North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. <laughs> Today we wish to continue our series with the grant from the Association for the Humanities uh, in Idaho. This particular grant deals with responsibility for our nature. This program is being put on uh, by that association in conjunction and cooperation with six faculty members at the University of Idaho. While they're in our city giving public lectures on these topics, we are dealing with that same issue on our program. We have already had programs, as you know, on history, law, and economics as it relates to our responsibility for nature. Today, it is a pleasure to welcome to our program the fourth of these six speakers, uh, Dr. Gary Williams. He holds a baccalaureate uh, from Washington University at St. Louis, a master's and a PhD from Cornell University. His field is American literature, published uh, also uh, in that field uh, with uh, such authors as Hawthorne, Cooper, and Faulkner. He has been at the University of Idaho for the past seven years is, and is an associate professor. Dr. Williams, welcome to our program. Thank you. We're going to be discussing with our guests this evening uh, the subject under that grant, uh, Sexual Metaphors for the American Landscape. In order to accomplish that task, it is my pleasure to welcome to our program our panel, uh, regular panelists, uh, Lou Reed, visiting panel member Jill McLeod, that's been with us many times before, and regular panelist Janelle Burke. We'll proceed to questions at once, and the first series will come from Mary Lou Reed. First of all, Gary, I would like to tell you that I very much liked your piece on sexual metaphors, and its elaboration of how literary images reflect our intimate feelings toward nature, and uh, that to the degree that these images are sexual and intimate and personal, they show the relatedness that we have uh, to nature instead of a separation from, from nature, and I think it's a very provocative study. As I understand it, your thesis, ma major thesis, is that the image of America as woman is one which is figured prominently in the imaginative literature of this country, I'm quoting you here, and may be most influential in the way Americans have perceived and used their land. And would you give some examples and expand upon this thesis of the image of America as woman uh, being influential in the way that we as Americans perceive and look at land. Oh, well, I begin in my lecture by talking, by reading a long passage from um, an 18th century botanist, William Bartram, um, in which the connections between uh, a natural landscape, which he's describing, and some Cherokee Indian virgins, as he called them, who calls them, who happen to be in the uh, landscape, uh, I, I, I try to suggest the way in which he uh, makes them almost indistinguishable from the other natural items in the, in the picture, turkeys, deer, uh, strawberry bushes. Uh, the suggestion is uh, that in some way the women, the, the, the young Cherokee women, are the spirits of the place. Um, that particular passage is the, maybe the, uh, the most explicit of a whole series of uh, similar passages in earlier writing about the New World. Uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries, there are many uh, uh, tracks which uh, give the record of exploration of the New World, uh, various uh, explorers' accounts of their experiences. And they, uh, they simply tend to talk about the, the land as a woman. They attribute feminine characteristics to it. Um, I, I don't have it to quote exactly, but the most striking instance of this is Sir Walter Raleigh calling uh, Guiana uh, uh, a country which hath yet her maidenhead. Uh, but there are other instances of it. Uh, the, the land is, the land is uh, talked about as uh, sweet, beautiful, wholesome. Uh, it, had, it, it very often has a pleasant odor. Um, uh, Various other things like that, and my thesis, um, based on on uh, on these, the appearance of this metaphor in early writing, 
my effort in the essay or the lecture is to try to uh, trace this metaphor through uh, more conventional literary works, novels. Um, I talk about Cooper, uh, the Leatherstocking novels, and I talk about uh, Willa Cather and James Dickey's Deliverance. Do you think this is unique to American writing, or do you think that this is actually following through in a long series of of just sort of from, from ancient times where, where the earth itself has been perceived as female? No, no, it's not unique. Uh, uh, as you say, uh, earliest uh, recorded myths, really, uh, from ancient Greece suggest that the terrain has a feminine aspect. Uh, I'm basically working with Annette Kolodny's idea. Annette Kolodny is the author of a book called The Lay of the Land, uh, which, which argues that the metaphor is much more prominent in writing about the New World than it is in the literatures of other countries. It's not the only one, certainly. But it is, it is prominent. But, and it's unique in, in some ways. Yes. And it ha it's one that has been picked up by uh, imaginative writers, writers of fiction and poetry and so on, in a way that it has not been in other cultures. Thank you. Jim McLeod. <coughs> Gary, uh, you mentioned that, uh, in talking about Bartram's uh, language, you mentioned that uh, a 20th century reader would recognize uh, the offer and consumption of fruit as being a uh, surrogate sexual experience. I'm wondering uh, if you're implying by that that the 20th century reader is a much more sophisticated reader than, say, Bartram's audience at that time. I guess that's what you are saying. And I, I, I wondered if, if you're saying that the people that lived during the 18th century were naive about these matters. Now, I find it difficult to believe that, that in reading the uh, passage, and I guess we can't do this over the air, but that uh, they wouldn't there wouldn't be uh, many of them who would recognize that uh, the sexual content of it. I suppose that when you mention Freud uh, shortly thereafter, there wouldn't necessarily be the Freudian connection, but uh, I would have to believe that there was something to this before Freud pointed it out at any rate. Well, I think citizens of post-Freudian culture are accustomed to receive practically everything uh, as sexual. Uh, uh, but as I, as I think I also say, the... Uh, the, there are many aspects of the, of the description which uh, intimate that the scene is a sexual one. Uh, the mere offering of fruit is, is just one of many examples in that particular passage of, uh, of uh, Bartram playing with an idea uh, that, uh, uh, that becomes more explicit, I think, from a 20th century, from a post-Freudian point of view, I should say. I would find that the... Uh, that the a reader who would miss those overtures in that particular passage would miss, miss a great deal of its literary value, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, you make mention uh, shortly thereafter uh, about the image of America as a woman, as that being a, a central uh, theme. And I think Lou has already referred to that. You mentioned uh, in particular that she's seen often as the mother, the virgin, and the compliant, inexhaustible mistress. Uh, and then you mentioned that this is often done in, in, in the modern novel, a modern context. Uh, can you think of any instances, modern instances, in which you see that particular idea being portrayed as well? Well, how modern do you mean? I, I do talk about deliverance uh, in my essay. Um, it seems to me that uh, uh, Faulkner would have been another um, wonderful example. In particular, I've, uh, I've been thinking I, I might have uh, spent some time in my lecture on uh, the section from Go Down Moses called The Bear. Uh, Ike McCaslin's uh, involvement in that part of Go Down Moses with uh, the terrain that he eventually gives up his birthright to protect is, uh, uh, is a sexual involvement. He sees it, uh, he sees it as a mistress. Um, I quote toward the end of my lecture an Adrienne Rich poem. Uh, the passage that I quote is uh, one, one of a number of passages in which uh, she describes the landscape as feminine, as a woman. Uh, there are other feminist poets who do this. Uh, and there is, there is um, there's a recent book by a woman, Susan Griffin, uh, called uh, Women and Nature, The Roaring Inside Her, uh, in which uh, there are many, uh, many other examples of the same, of the same imagery appearing. Uh, in general, femi the feminist uh, 
tack on, on, the, uh, on studies or discussions of this metaphor is to suggest that it's harmful, uh, that uh, we are in the service of an outmoded series of, of images for the land, uh, and that they are responsible for what we're doing to it. Janelle Berg. You also speak about the health of male-female relationships and say that they are important. The way that we tend to deal with male-female relationships is also perhaps how we tend to deal with the land. Would you care to, to follow up on that, uh, explaining that neither domination nor idolization is a perfect uh, relationship, but perhaps partnership is a better relationship. Would you care to uh, talk about Willa Cather's novel, The Lost Lady, and any others that you might think of? Yes, the, uh, the phenomenon, uh, I think, is really more a literary one uh, than perhaps it is a, a one in fact. Uh, it, it is the case, uh, I'm simply being historical basically in my lecture, uh, it is the case that writers have tended to connect male attitudes toward women characters in novels to their attitudes toward the land. It's the case in the Willa, Willa Cather novel, uh, A Lost Lady. Uh, the, the landscape uh, that's under question is owned by uh, Captain Forrester in that novel. Uh, he's a former developer for the Burlington Railroad who has retired on a, on a piece of land that he saved for himself adjacent to the tracks of the Burlington. Uh, and he's kept uh, a segment of his land in its natural state. It's a, there's a kind of a marsh that he's uh, preserved because he loves its beauty. Um, his, uh, when he talks about the marsh, uh, the, the tone is the same as when he talks about his uh, much younger wife, uh, Marion, who is the lost lady of the title. Uh, he, has, he has married her, um, well, it's difficult to tell, but there is the sense that he has married her out of a, out of a sort of desire to preserve the beautiful intact. She's been sort of wild previous to their marriage or previous to their meeting, and uh, 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 he rescues her. Uh, they meet when he rescues her from a bad fall. She's mountain climbing. Um, and he takes her away from all of that to, uh, to Sweetwater, Nebraska, uh, and uh, attempts to put her under glass, really, uh, in the same way that he's, that he's attempted to preserve this piece of his land. Uh, there's another character in the, no in the novel, Ivy Peters, whose attitude toward the land is to uh, value it in terms of its, uh, what he can get out of it financially. Um, eventually, he assumes or he uh, attains financial control over the forester's property and drains the marsh uh, in order to plant it in profitable wheat. His attitude toward Marion Forrester is a much more rapacious attitude than her husband's. Uh, he's, uh, well, in various ways, uh, he, he, he treats her badly. He, he tends to exercise power, sexual power, over her without, uh, in fact, uh, there being a sexual relationship between them. Um, I argue that he rapes the land because he specifically denied uh, sexual access to Marion Forrester. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've joined our program in progress, we are in our fourth program of, that deals with the grant from the Association of the Humanities concerning our responsibility for nature. Our guest is Dr. Gary Williams from the University of Idaho. Uh, we are dealing with sexual metaphors for the American landscape, and we shall continue the question with Mary Lou Reed. Gary, would you talk about wilderness for a little bit? Uh, you talk about uh, Natty Bumpo, Cooper's Natty Bumpo, as seeing wilderness as a, a nurturing mother who provides abundantly. And is it not more common for wilderness to be seen as a masculine entity, as, as rather threatening and, and as aggressive, as you point out in, in the, in the Dickey's uh, novel, Deliverance? Is not uh, wilderness as a nurturing entity um, really uncommon? That aggressiveness, aggression uh, is more typical? Well, it depends. It depends on what body of literature you're looking at. Uh, it would be a much more common image uh, uh, the, the image of, of nature or the wilderness as a mother would, would be much more common in the 19th century or the early 18th or late 18th century uh, than earlier, perhaps. The Puritans, for instance, uh, most Puritan writing uh, 
uh, tip of, uh, describes the landscape as hostile, um, not necessarily masculine, but brutal, uh, a difficult environment. Uh, often in Puritan writing, it's the abode of the devil, uh, or of, uh, uh, it's, since it's the Indian's domain, it is, it is the, uh, the domain also of Satan. Um, and in that sense, it's hostile, but not necessarily masculine. Uh, my sense about Dickey, uh, Dickey's use of the metaphor, uh, is that he's consciously playing with, with uh, an earlier tradition of the wilderness as feminine, uh, that he's specifically, deliberately re reversing it for his purposes, uh, feminizing the men uh, to the extent that they're, that they're beaten down by the wilderness until they respond as it appears the wilderness expects them to respond, in which, at which point the wilderness becomes feminized. Um, in their conquering of the wilderness, they are able to feminize it. Right. Uh, when Ed Gentry climbs the cliff uh, that he must climb in order to save his friends and to kill the, the second mountain men that may be waiting for them, um, he, uh, his, uh, well, the climb up the cliff is described in specifically sexual terms, and he's, um, uh, he becomes master of the terrain uh, as he, as we've earlier seen him, master of his wife uh, in a sexual scene. Can you make some linkages between uh, this, this perception, these images of wilderness and uh, perhaps how we now see wilderness and treat it? Is this perhaps one of these outmoded images that uh, affects how we deal with, with wilderness? Well, uh, I, let me tell you what happened after I uh, delivered the lecture in Moscow. Uh, a, 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 a startled woman in the audience uh, wanted me to clarify whether or not I was saying that to go out into the wilderness uh, to, ha to have a, a profound experience outside of uh, civilization uh, necess necessitated uh, uh, putting off of sexuality and that uh, uh, when, w when you come back uh, to, the, uh, uh, to society, you're necessarily sexless for a period of time because of the, <laughs> the kind of experience you had. And what did you say? Well, <laughs> I, I said what I think I've already said here, that I was, uh, I'm merely talking really about some books, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the way in which this experience has been described by a few writers, uh, uh, and that I also uh, uh, experience the wilderness as a profound feeling, which is not, not at all a, uh, or uh, not, um, doesn't, doesn't deprive one of one's sexuality, or is, or is not perceived at the time as a sexual experience. Uh, but I think that, uh, I think that um, the uh, Kaladny's notion that uh, metaphors control the way we operate is perhaps more, um, control the way we operate on the land is perhaps more uh, applicable to people who are in uh, positions of more power than most people I know, certainly than I am. Uh, people who, uh, who are in the uh, position of making decisions about whether to build dams or uh, uh, cut down trees. You mean the decision makers believe their rhetoric? The decision makers, Kaladny argues, are controlled by it uh, without, without being conscious of it. Jim McLeod. Gary, um, you mentioned that, uh, that Cooper um, portrays Natty Bumpo in a sort of, uh, if I don't misunderstand you here, uh, ultimately as an asexual man in terms of his relationship with nature. Uh, I've always perceived him as someone who lives in harmony with nature. He's natural man, uh, Rousseau's noble savage. Uh, is that to suggest that the way for us to live in harmony with nature is to be asexual, in a sense? And I, maybe that's the same way, same question you're being asked by that woman in the audience, but it seems to me to, to raise the question as to which, what, what would be the proper metaphor for us to have in terms of wil the wilderness, if, if you feel like answering that. Well, uh, Kaladny, Annette Kaladny says that the idea of Natty Bumpo arose for Cooper when he, Cooper, perceived the impossibility of a white community living harmoniously, non-exploitively with nature. Um, and probably the stronger point 
uh, of, of the two that I make uh, about Natty Bumpo is that he, that um, solitude or, or, or solitariness is, uh, is more conducive to a harmonious relationship with nature than uh, uh, living without a woman. Um, Natty, it is true, it is an asexual being, uh, particularly this is emphasized in the last two books of the series, but he is also a solitary man, and it's not clear whether his salubrious relationship with nature is a function of, his, of the fact that he lives alone or the fact that he lives without women. Uh, that is to say, lives apart from a, a community or lives without women. Um, as, as to the question about an alternate metaphor, um, I think that uh, it seems to me that the way out of the bind, if, we, if there is a bind here, uh, of uh, considering nature as feminine is simply not to consider it uh, as uh, connected with, with uh, sexuality, uh, to experience it in other terms. Um, but I think probably that the real, the real thing I'm concerned about in my lecture is not so much how we, we uh, involve ourselves in nature or perceive nature as how we, how we involve, how men involve themselves or, or perceive women. Um, uh, I end with a quote from Adrienne Rich's uh, poem, uh, The Phenomenology of Anger, which describes a, an argument between a man and a woman, uh, which ends by the man leaving to go out and uh, as she says, defoliate the fields we lived from, spreading impotence on the world. Um, she, he's prompted to do this by her asking him the question, what do you feel? Are you feeling anything? And his response is to leave. Uh, the, the alternative to this hostile situation um, that Rich envisions in this poem is um, is a community um, much more harmoniously connected to nature, a city but a natural city, uh, mineral houses, uh, thatched huts, um, which is also a community of men and women living harmoniously uh, together. Dr. Williams, from your uh, interpretation of James Biddemore Cooper's work, uh, did I read you correctly when the, I, I seem to get from your work uh, the idea that not only can we interpret that some of these writers had uh, the sexual metaphors connection as far as the landscape is concerned, but that maybe many areas of music and the fine arts and the humanities that we deal with, particularly in these kind of grants, uh, has a com uh, comparison with a, one might say, natural state of the landscape. You mentioned the fact of, uh, that the wind blowing through the tree and so forth was music to uh, uh, certain characters. Do you expand this on beyond uh, what we've just been addressing here tonight so far? You mean beyond literature? Uh, yes, and into uh, the entire field of the humanities. I'm especially thinking of the field of music, uh, and again referring back to James Cooper's work and, and what you had to say. Well, the passage, the passage that you refer to is uh, a passage where Natty is describing his, um, his sense of his sweetheart. He's been asked yes. if he has a sweetheart. And he says, uh, yes, yeah, she's, she's in the forest, uh, sighing in the boughs of the trees and, and rippling in a native uh, uh, sparkling fountain. Um, I, think, I, I think Natty uh, is not oh, uh, civilized enough to, uh, uh, to, f uh, to understand that he's, he's making a musical metaphor here. And I, um, in my paper, I'm really, really focusing on matters of language. Uh, I'm not sure how one would uh, talk about uh, uh, music or uh, other, uh, other non-tangible uh, art forms as, uh, as metaphorical. Uh, certainly painting uh, uh, has depicted the land as feminine. Um, sculpture. <laughs> Janelle Burke. Believing that we do see certain images and we read about them and, and that uh, reinforces those images, uh, let's now talk a little bit about the state of Idaho, which is, has a great deal of wilderness and so forth. And you can sort of give me your, your uh, uh, feelings about 
does the romance fade once we've conquered the land? I mean, do you is there more romance in the East than there is in the West? Can we expect a more independent Idahoan because of this kind of uh, um, metaphor and image playing in the mind? Does the romance fade as you conquer the land? Yes. In other words, as the land is, is lived with longer, does the romance fade? Is the romance newest where the land is, is least conquered? Well, Cooper uh, was a product of the frontier, but the, the romance flowered when he was farthest east. Uh, his, um, the height of his fame, uh, the result of the Leatherstocking Tales, uh, came when he was in Paris uh, 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 dreaming about, uh, as D.H. Lawrence postulates, that he's dreaming about uh, Natty Bumpo and uh, Chingachgook out in the woods. Um, and it, it, it is true uh, in, in the literary history of the country that the, uh, the times when nature is most romanticized are the times when uh, writers have most contact with untrammeled nature. Um, Willa Cather uh, romanticizes the West, uh, and she, she's, a, she's an early person. She's a pioneer. Um, Cooper, I've, I've already suggested. When when in 1890 uh, the U.S. Census indicated that the frontier had vanished, uh, the general sense about nature is not romantic at all, or is romantic in an, ob in an, in an obverse way from the way we've been talking about it. It is, it is not uh, a pleasant uh, environment. It is not feminine. It is, again, harsh and brutal and uh, 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 a place where man has trouble. Uh, it's not a it's not a romantic view of, of nature at all. Would you care to comment on my uh, on my statement? The politicians who are most anxious to conquer the land are also the least sensitive to women's issues. Gee, I I I, I simply do not know. I I uh, I couldn't say. Okay, but from what the literature would that follow? From what the literature sort of points out that. that well, it has it has a kind of wonderful. Uh, uh, it's the kind of thing you hope is true or, or uh, imagine is true, uh, uh, that there's that kind of nice correlation between um, votes on uh, environmental issues and votes on the ERA. But um, I, I don't know. How about <laughs> With that, I have to bring our program to the conclusion. I'm sorry, Janelle. We're out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, our program uh, this evening has been the fourth in this series of Our Responsibility for Nature, a grant from the Association for the Humanities in Idaho. In three or four weeks, we will bring you program number five that will be entitled The Politics of Nature, and Dr. Neil McFeely, a political scientist at the University of Idaho, will be with us on that program. Next week, we'll be dealing with another subject in another field, and I hope you'll be with us. Have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. <laughs>